Welcome back, everybody. Um, we're at a really good point in this course where you've had at least some experience writing down the statistical model that reflects something of interest to you in the world, writing down the likelihood function from that model, taking the log of the likelihood function, now we ha then we have a function, <coughs> taking the log of that likelihood function and putting it into code, taking that code, which is a function in, in, in R or another language, uh, giving it to a numerical optimization procedure like Optim in R, asking it to find the maximum likelihood estimates and the variance covariance matrix. With that, we can make a few assumptions like the central limit theorem. We can uh, take simulations from our model given our data and given, of course, the model. Um, from that, we can take the simulations and we can express them in the ways that we choose, not our computer program, and ideally in ways that our audience would be particularly interested in. Um, so uh, the only thing we don't have is complete familiarity with all these concepts. You've seen them all in regression, in forecasting presidential elections and the particular features of that. And we've done it in li um, uh, linear probability and logit and probit models. Um, takes a while to really um, get completely familiar with this, but what this point in the course enables you to do, what this experience enables you to do, is to look at the vista of all the possible models out there because they're all now actually accessible to you. You'll get the hang of it as you look at more and more of these models, but um, the great thing now is that we've seen all of this a few times, and so we can now begin to pick up the speed and see models faster and faster, and then choose ones eventually that are particularly suited to our uh, statistical problem and our substantive problem. So uh, today, we're going to look at um, ordered probit and ordered logit models, so, you know, where the dependent variable has, takes on an order. We're going to look at grouped binary uh, variable models, where the dependent variable is a count out of a certain number of things. Uh, we'll look at count models, where you just count up the number of times something happens, and duration models, how long something takes. Um, and also, those models are a great way of introducing censoring, when sometimes you don't actually see all the data that you would like to see. Um, so, so we're going to be able to go faster because, we're gonna, because we have this experience, but um, we're going to go just as deep, and uh, this should enable us to not only learn these models, but to get enough experience uh, that we start to become more familiar with all the techniques that I just listed. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so now we have ordered dependent variable models. Let's start with an ordered probit. So an ordered probit has uh, y star following or distributed as a stylized normal distribution. That's a normal distribution with mean mu and variance one. Um, <clears throat> we have a systematic component, which is, uh, which is linear. So mu of i is equal to x, x sub beta. And then the last component of the statistical model in this case is, again, independence of uh, observation i and observation i prime. Um, <clears throat> uh, so think about this. What's the model if y star is observed? So if we observe y star, what would this be? Is it a linear regression? Well, what I about the assumption that sigma squared is 1? What happens if we run a linear regression with sigma squared equal to 1? Okay, well, um, obviously we're making an assumption in that case that might be wrong. It's a little like a stopped clock. If it's right, it's right. If it's wrong, it's wrong, and it'll be right sometimes, and you don't know when it's right, and you don't know when it's wrong. Um, uh, and so it's a little weird uh, uh, assumption there. However, we don't actually know y star. We're making up y star. We're, we're, our outcome variable, of course, is going to be ordinal, and I'm going to show you that in a second. But right now, we're making it up. So when you make it up, you have to make a scale of the thing. You can't just say it's unobserved and we don't know anything about it because we're not going to get anywhere. So, so we, we set a scale. Okay, so no big deal. We set a scale. And what that means is then that the sigma squared equaling 1 in the ordered probit model if we actually uh, observe just the ordered outcomes and it is an uh, unobserved variable that we're going to make an inference to, then that thing 
is that sigma squared is actually an axiom rather than an assumption. So we could change it to two rather than one or 10 or something like that. And it would be a little like changing the axioms of probability so that instead of ranging from zero to one, probabilities range from zero to 12, right? It would be okay. We could still use it. it all the theory, probability theory would work. We'd just have to change all the notation. Um, um, and the interpretations, the substantive interpretations here would basically be the same. We would just use num different numbers to represent them. Okay. Um, so now here's the part that I think you expected was coming. Um, y of i is uh, now going to be ordinal. Uh, so this is the math for it, and this is the, the uh, pictorial view of it. Nice colorful picture, don't you think? Um, so here's the story. Um, when y star is drawn from the stylized normal distribution according to this model, where the mean of this is pushed around by the explanatory variables. Y star is not something we get to observe. Instead, Y star is, right, this is the distribution, this is the stylized normal. Um, y star is falls somewhere here, okay? If it falls, let's say, to the right of tau five, which is just a threshold, in the orange area, then we're gonna observe a J equal to six. So that's what these things say. This says we're going to observe for y of i one of, one of the values, and the values are dependent upon the thresholds of the taus. So tau sub j and tau, of, tau sub j minus 1, also sub i for, the, for observation. So that's, the, that's basically how we're going to um, set, things, set things up here. Um, <clears throat> uh, think to yourself that where would you apply this model in the real world? Okay, uh, in you, for your substantive applications. Okay, do you have an outcome variable for which um, it, you don't actually know the distances between a one and a two and a two and a three? Okay, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. If you have number of deaths, well, you know, the difference between two and three and a hundred and a hundred and one, that's the same thing, at least with respect to people and deaths. It might be different with respect to politics or something like that. Um, but, uh, but, but in terms of the variable you're measuring, the interval is the same. However, if it's something like, um, if your dependent variable is, measures conflict, and what you've actually measured, the, 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 one, two, the, the J, the one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven, or whatever it is, um, is, um, is agree, disagree, um, uh, yell, punch, uh, 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 kill, blow up, you know, genocide, whatever it is, um, then the distances between those are clearly not the same and also perhaps of substantive interest all by themselves. At that case, for that kind of model, we certainly would want to figure out um, how to use this model um, to, to study that, that kind of setup. And the taus are not fixed here. The taus are estimated, and therefore they can move around, and we can learn how far the taus are apart, and that's actually a really interesting uh, part of this model. It's the central contribution of this, mo of this model, really. Suppose, however, you have an outcome variable, which is a survey, and the survey is strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, strongly agree. You absolutely could use the ordered probit model for this case. But what do you think the tau, how do you think the taus are going to come out in this case? Do you think they're going to come out so that the difference between strongly disagree and strongly, um, uh, and, and between strongly disagree and disagree is going to be very different than between disagree and neutral? I don't know. I mean, I mean my, my inclination is to say that they're approximately interval ordered. And the, and, and the distances are about the same. And so I might not be willing to go the extra step and estimate the extra parameters necessary in this model, which are the taus. We're going to have to estimate them. Um, and so I'd have to decide. Because remember, a model is always an abstraction. It's not true that any time you have a model with a somewhat more complicated feature, you should always use it because clearly the real world will have some, some piece of that. That's not true because every time you demand more of the data, it's going to cost you more, right? It's going to cost you more in terms of your standard errors and things like that. So you have to decide always what to assume and what to, um, uh, and, and what to go and, go and model and estimate. Um, 
Uh, note, however, that that doesn't mean you shouldn't use this for surveys. It's very common to use this, for this, this model for surveys. And if you find that in the strongly disagree to strongly agree model, that there really is a big difference and it's not interval ordered, that's a finding, right? That's a really interesting finding. So if you think there's a chance that you might find something cool, then go for it. Also, it's not very hard to run this model. So, um, uh, so you might consider that as well. Okay. Um, <clears throat> with the observation mechanism that we have here, then we're going to estimate the beta, and the beta is going to be the same beta as in linear regression, except we don't really get to know the scale of the outcome variable. In fact, we're basically assuming it. That's what Y star is. Um, uh, so we should think about how to interpret it exactly. Um, uh, one, way of, one way of thinking about the interpretation is that um, Y star is a continuous underlying um, normal variable, which has um, mean mu and variance 1. And so we can interpret it the same way as ordered probit if we like. Uh, and so when x goes up, when x1, or you know xj, or not, not j, j is the outcome in this case, but when x1 goes up by 1, holding constant all the other explanatory variables, uh, the expected value of y star increases by beta standard deviation units, right? Because that's basically the, that is the uh, scale which we've chosen for the variable. Um, uh, and that's the, and so that's one perfectly legitimate way of interpreting this model. I'll show you some other ways as well. Uh, if instead of assuming that it's a stylized normal distribution that the um, unobserved variable follows, if instead we have an ordered, uh, uh, if instead we have a stylized logistic distribution instead of a stylized normal distribution, then instead of an ordered probit model, we have an ordered logit model. Not a real big difference between, between them, but just so you know. So now let's derive the ordered probit likelihood function so we can keep going and estimate it. Um, so first the probability of one observation and then the probability of all the observations. For one observation, the probability that y of i takes on one of the ordered values, which I'm, which I'm calling j, is the same as the probability that y star falls between two of the appropriate, you know, the appropriate two taus. Um, if it falls in color yellow, it's a particular j. If it falls in color red, it's in a particular j, uh, given the graph on the previous page. Um, how do you get that probability? Well, it's the area under the curve. That, it, that is in that particular color, which we get by integration. So it's in the integral from one of the taus to the next tau in the area under that curve. So we're basically figuring out what's the area that's red divided by the total area, which is one. Um, in this case, it's the stylized normal. That's, that's, that's the function. Um, so one way of getting that is doing the integration. Another way of getting that is to use the cumulative normal distribution function and integrate all the way up to the second tau and subtract the integral up to the first tau. So that's the difference between two cumulative normal distribution functions gives us the area in between. It's just an easier way of doing it. Um, what I did here now on the screen is um, is do is reparameterization, which we always do. It's a it's an important step, um, and what that involves is using the systematic component to substitute in whenever we see mu to substitute in x beta right into the uh, into the expression there. Um, okay, the way do we get the joint probability? It's quite straightforward. We use the third part of the model, which in this case is the independence assumption. We substitute that in by merely taking the product of the probabilities over the n observations. And that's the joint probability. It looks quite simple. Um, the log likelihood is now the log of this. So the log of the likelihood is the log of the product, which is the sum of the logs of the probabilities. Um, <clears throat> note one little step here is each of these probabilities now we've implicitly assumed can't be zero because if it was zero, we couldn't take the log, and so then nothing really works. So the whole model assumes that there's some probability in each, in each one of those categories, but if you think about it, the normal distribution has non-zero probability over any, any um, uh, non-zero width interval, so it, it actually fits. Um, then we're going to take the probability in this line and substitute in for it th the last line here, so we take this line, substitute in for this, and we get that. And that's quite straightforward. Um, 
And, and then basically we take that, that's the log likelihood function, that's what we put into code, that's what we ask uh, Optum uh, to optimize to find the maximum for. It's the maximum with respect to beta and now also the taus. So the taus are some of our parameters. Um, and we have to estimate those along, along with it. Remember back in the logit model, we had, we did actually, or on the probit model, we did actually have a tau. It was just because it was only one of them, it was set to zero. So that's sort of what you do, what you do with these models. To set the scale, one of the taus has to be picked, uh, it has to be set to some arbitrary value, because otherwise, you know, we're making this thing up. You have to have some, uh, 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 you know, point of reference. So we just define the point of reference. That's an axiom, not an assumption. And it seems like a reasonable way to go to just, uh, just set the first one to zero. Um, uh, and if you only have one threshold, then it's just zero and you don't have to estimate anything. But if you have more than that, then you have to estimate the taus. But when you do that, uh, remember, we try to reparameterize uh, into the unbounded scale. And when you do that, when you reparameterize into the unbounded scale, um, uh, it, it makes it easy for the optimization program. But in this case, it's more difficult because the parameters are related to each other. It doesn't make any sense for tau2 to be greater than tau3, right? There's no reason to let the optimization function do it. So there's some tricks, there's some ways of, ways of doing this. Um, uh, but you just have to remember that that's something that has to be attended to. Okay, so let's interpret the results. Um, what's beta? Well, beta uh, is um, the linear effect of x on y star in standard deviation units, like I mentioned before, when x3 goes up by 1, uh, y star goes up, we expect, by beta holding constant the other explanatory variables. Um, uh, it goes up by beta standard deviation units, sorry. Um, so that's the, the, the unit of this unobserved variable. Um, but of course, that's an unobserved variable. It's not very satisfying to explain things in terms of an un unobserved variable. We want to explain things in terms of the actual data that we have. In this case, it's the Js. It's the, uh, it's the category that are, that are ordered. Um, uh, so where are we going to get that from? Well, we observe for a set of people what category they're in. If we're going to estimate what category somebody might be in, if they took on different values of the explanatory variables, then what we get out of the model are probabilities of being in each category. So it's important to understand that, you know, that even one predicted value produces if the, uh, j different, different numbers, right? Because um, you know, if there's three categories, then um, one predicted value produces a probability for each of those three values. Now, let's just think about what those probabilities are. They fall on what's called the simplex. So that's a uh, nice mathematical term. All it means is that those probabilities, they're probabilities, so each one is between zero and one, and they sum up to one. So that's what the simplex is. I'll show you an example of the mathematical concept of a simplex, but that's all it is. Um, a first difference, if we, if we choose to calculate that, where we hold all the, the explanatory variables perhaps constant at some value, except one of them we, one of them we move, then the first, and we, we look at what the effect is on the outcome. The outcome now is a set of J things. We have to watch them all moving, right? So it's a little more complicated. And perhaps also more interesting. Um, when one, we have to understand also that when one probability goes up, at least one of the others has to go down because they have to sum to one. I mean, they do sum to one. They must sum to one. So, so that kind of relationship happens. So you have to be careful that we don't trick ourselves into thinking there's a result when there isn't a result, right? If you, if you cause one of those probabilities to go up, it's not a surprise that some other category goes down. It's a mathematical requirement, right? Um, okay. So, I'm going to give you one way of interpreting these results. Uh, it's a good way of visualizing it. It works when there's three or two categories. Um, and I'm going to give you a nice graph. And this graph is actually not from an ordered probit model. It's just going to make it a little more realistic. Uh, it's from a, a paper that I wrote with Jonathan Katz um, with real data. So the, where we actually observe the what are probabilities in the ordered probit model. And this is the, in UK elections um, in Britain, um, there are, there's the, the Labour Party, there's the Conservatives, and then there's often a collection of other parties, which is uh, sometimes called the Alliance. 
Um, and, I mean, depending upon what they, w w how they organize themselves. Um, but when we did this, they were certainly called the Alliance. And so you can imagine the, um, the three party vote, each one of which um, is between zero and one in terms of a proportion and all three of them sum up to one. So it's exactly the same thing as in ordered probit when we have three probabilities. I just thought I would give you an example that um, might be a little more interesting. Um, so, and it's more interesting because we sort of know what each of the dots are. Okay, so now I'm gonna explain what this, what this crazy figure is. So, but think about it this way. So <clears throat> we, what we're gonna do is we're gonna graph the probabilities. How are we gonna graph them? So, oops. <clears throat> we're gonna graph them in the following way. So we're gonna have the, the proportion for the Labour Party along, along this axis, the proportion for the Labour Party from zero to 100, zero to one, the proportion for the Conservatives on this axis from zero to one, and the pr proportion for the Alliance on this axis from zero to one. And then we're gonna take one constituency, one geographic district in Britain is called a constituency, and we're gonna plot, plot that constituency in three-dimensional space. So maybe it would be right here, or right here, or right here. Okay, now let's think about the places where it could be, right? So if, it, if, if that constituency gave 100% uh, of its vote, to the, to, to the party represented on this axis, it would be all the way over here. What would the other two parties be? They would be zero, right? It would be zero on this vertical axis and it would be zero on that axis. The dot would be exactly there, okay? If it gave zero to this party, then it would be, it would be over here, but we don't know how much it gave to the other two parties. We'd have to, we'd have to learn that. But if it gave 100% to this party, then it would be all the way over here, right? It's zero to one. So it would, be, it would go over to one and the other parties would get zero. So it's a simplex. That is the three are related. They sum up to one. Mathematically, if we have this graph that, that goes um, and, uh, one party, a second party and a third party, and then we take um, a plane and slice through this three dimensional space, it makes a triangle. Why is it a triangle? Well, we have this and this, and we have this, right? Um, and then we're gonna slice through this and it's a triangle. And it turns out that each of these dots must fall on the triangle because they sum up to 100%. And the only points in this three-dimensional space that sum up to one are on that triangle. So let's take the triangle, right? And let's, let's think about the triangle. We start off with three-dimensional space, but it turns out that the problem is only two-dimensional. Right, because there aren't really three free parameters, there's really only two. So let's use that for graphing, and we'll take the slice, which is a triangle, pull it out of the three-dimensional space, um, sort of like what they did in Flatland, right, and put it right on the page. So that, that triangle is the simplex. It's sometimes called the ternary diagram. Um, and this is uh, alliance, this is labor, and this is, this is conservative. And this is sort of a cool way of representing results. This comes from a, a, an article that we wrote. Um, so <clears throat> so the, way, the way you interpret this is we actually put ax axes on here. So, so for every dot on this graph, um, it, it, it is represented in all three axes. So let's look at this. This is the conservative vote. The conservatives, conservatives are at this axis. 100% of the vote when it's one, uh, if a constituency wins uncontested, basically 100% of the vote, they would be in this, in this corner. If the Alliance wins 100%, they're here. If the, the, the Labor Party wins 100%, they're here. So this, is, this goes from zero to 100. That's, so basically the, the distance from the opposite angle, the opposite side is conservative. The distance from the opposite side of L is Labor, and the distance from opposite side of a is alliance, right? So the, the closer you are to each corner is how much you, you get for, from that party. The dots along here, along this side, were not contested by the alliance because the alliance um, on this axis gave zero vote, you know, but voters gave zero votes to the alliance. In, in a real election, nobody gives zero votes to a, to a party. Um, it just essentially never happens, um, no matter how wacky the candidates are, um, unless they don't run. So these are, these are uncontested uh, elections. And you can see that, that generalization that I had because these are uncontested and then these are contested. The difference between these two is maybe 
15, 20% of the vote. And then there's nothing in the middle there, right? Essentially nothing in the middle there. It's very rare that there's anything in the middle there. And that's the generalization that I have that you, you never get 3% of the vote if you run for election. You'll always get, you know, 10 or 15 or something. Um, so, um, uh, so you can see the uncontested there. There's, uh, there's no uncontested here or here because the Labor Party and the Conservative Party are national parties. They run everywhere. And then this is the, the pattern of results. We, we drew win lines on here. What, that's what we call win lines because when the Conservatives won the district, they get a plurality of the vote, more votes than the Alliance or Labor, then a dot has to appear in this region. If the Labor Party wins, um, <clears throat> a dot appears in this region, or another way of saying it is if a dot appears in this region, the Labor Party wins. And if, it, if a dot appears in this region, the Alliance wins. And so it's a nice way of summarizing you know, all the data all at once to get a feel for it. You might use this to look at the output of um, a whole set of data um, when you change some of the explanatory variables. So for example, you could take the data and do a now cast and just forecast the probability of voting uh, or of uh, choosing each of the outcome variables. Um, outcome, excuse me. You could uh, run your model substitute in the observed values of the explanatory variables, make a prediction. The prediction gives a probability for each outcome. You actually know the true outcome, but but we have a probability given the model. We could plot the probabilities give, uh, pro we could plot the probabilities on this graph if you only had three categories. You could plot them all on this graph. And then what we could do is we could apply a counterfactual. Um, we could say, what would happen if unemployment went from 20% to, to, to 30% or, 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 or whatever? We can, we can say, what happens if more people oppose the government, right, if those were explanatory variables? And then we can change all those, just those values of the explanatory variables, make us another set of forecasts. These would be counterfactual predictions rather than nowcasts. Um, they would be another set of dots, and we could plot those in a different color on the same graph. We might even take each dot that was a, a nowcast and each dot that's a counterfactual prediction and have an arrow between them, and we can see the directions of the arrows. There's a lot of ways of doing this, and which is the right way depends upon what you're trying to achieve, what point your results uh, make, and who you're trying to persuade, really. Okay. All right, so that's ordered dependent variable models. Now let's switch to grouped binary variable models. All right, here's how they work. Um, we will um, start with the simplest version, which is um, the um, uh, which is an independence. Uh, you'll see the independence assumption. Okay, a grouped uncorrelated binary model. Um, it's going to be the same as binary logit but instead of observing the outcome of the binary, or in, in, in Logit's case, Bernoulli trials, we're only going to observe the sum of independent and identically distributed Bernoulli trials. Um, think about where you would apply this. What are the applications for which you would, you would apply this, right? It could be something like uh, if you did a survey and you asked a question, what's the number of times in the last week that you read the newspaper? Right. Well, then you would have a number. It would be, it, you would only observe a six or something like that, but it would be the result of seven binary choices. I could read the newspaper or not read the newspaper on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, oops, all the way up to Sunday. Um, we could, we could um, uh, then add those up and what we observe, if the assumptions of the model are right, um, just the number of days that, that the person read the newspaper. Okay, so the model we have here uh, is that y of i, the number that we observe, which is going to be zero up to the total fixed capital N, is binomial. Um, y is the little y is the outcome, and pi is the unobserved probability assumed identical for each of the Bernoulli trials. Um, we're going to assume that the pi follows a logistic form, so 1 over 1 plus e to the minus x beta. Um, and we're going to note that the expected number of, uh, uh, the expected outcome is going to be pi times a capital N, which is known ahead of time, like number of days of the week in the example that I just gave you. Um, so the likelihood function now is just the binomial 
with the extra assumption that I didn't even write down here because I left it implicit because more and more we're going to be doing things like that, um, that there's independent across observations and the independence enables us to take the product over the observations and that, that's the product. Um, uh, um, we then substitute in the formula for the binomial. You've seen that before. Um, now let's do the log likelihood. So the log likelihood is the log of the likelihood of that whole formula. So how do we do that? This is what it looks like. The log of the sum of the, the log of the product is the sum of the logs of the log likelihood. We then take the log of the first piece, which uh, has no parameters. It's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to go away. Um, um, plus the log of the second piece, which is the log of pi to the y. And the way you do that is y goes out front and you get the log of pi, which is exactly what we have here. Um, and then the third piece, which is the log again of the, uh, uh, of the third piece, which is, uh, follows the same rule, which is the exponent comes out front and it's the log of, of the second piece. So that's the log of the likelihood function. We can then substitute in the systematic component and that's exactly what you get. Note that um, uh, after you rearrange a little, of course, we've dropped the piece with no, with no parameters. Um, note how similar this looks to the binary logit log likelihood model. Okay, uh, right, you can drop the n and put in a one, right? It's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's very close to that model, which makes sense because we're basically assuming that model plus a little bit more to get to the to get to the, uh, from the Bernoulli to the binomial. But sometimes you don't see the Bernoulli outcomes. You only get to know, you only get to observe the sum of them. And in that case, a grouped, a grouped binary model is the right way to go um, if they're independent. Okay, so let's interpret this result. Um, <clears throat> the inferential goal here is the same pi as in binary logit. Right, so that's sort of interesting. That even if we had the indiv if we had the individual results, we'd be interested in that pi. We don't have the individual results; we only have sums of them, uh, and we can still estimate the individual pi. Um, we're going to draw one simulation from this from this model in the following way: we maximize the log log likelihood. Right, we wrote the log likelihood on the previous page, so we're going to put it in code. We're going to ask Optima to, Optima to optimize it. When it when you put in data, it should find the maximum. When it finds the maximum, that's beta hat. Um, uh, there's no other parameters, just beta hat, right? Uh, and then you get the variance of beta hat as well. Uh, so that's the uh, that's the that's the log likelihood piece, um, uh, which we maximize. Then we uh, simulate from that. How do we do that? We assume assume the central limit theorem applies to these means, which are the the maximum likelihood estimates. So so how do we simulate? We simulate from a multivariate normal distribution with mean equal to the maximum likelihood point estimates and variance equal to the variance covariance matrix that also comes from from uh, maximizing the likelihood. Uh, um, we then are going to set our explanatory variables to a choice for each, for each of them, and I'll call that x sub c for choice. And we're going to calculate simulations of the probabilities that any of the component binary variables is a one, and the way that that is, is it's the same functional form as the binary logit, um, one of one plus e to the minus x beta. If you're actually interested in, in uh, pi, then you got it. No, right, you have a simulation of it, so you can plot a histogram of them, you can calculate the mean of them, you can calculate the fraction of the pies that are, are relatively high, which maybe is in your application 0.8, let's say, for some, something. There's lots of things you could do at that stage. If, however, you want the simulations of y, where do you get that from? From the stochastic component. So you get y drawn from the binomial distribution. That's the stochastic component in, the, in this case. Um, uh, when might you want that? Well, suppose you're interested in something like the probability that, um, we, you know, if, if it's numbers of days a week and we're only interested, let's say, in uh, the weekend, then, uh, or, a, or an amount of time equal to the weekend, because if we're only interested in the weekend, we have to ask about the weekend, but I already said we're not going to do that, right? Because we only know the number out of seven. So suppose we want to know how often people read the newspaper on uh, uh, zero, one, or two days and no more, right? So then you could take the simulations and we could just, 
uh, sum up the fraction of times you get a zero, one, or two, and divide by the total. So that's another thing you could do. Um, okay, from that, we can compute quantities of interest as you choose. Um, <clears throat> the means, the histogram, the standard deviation, you can make confidence intervals. Choose based upon the people, the audience that you're trying to persuade, and also based upon the types of results that you have that are most compelling. Okay. Um, now, we've talked about the grouped uncorrelated binary model, and now we're going to do the grouped, the grouped correlated binary model. So I said before when we were doing the uncorrelated binary model that we had this independence assumption across the um, Bernoulli trials. Suppose we don't have independence. Well, then we need, a, we need something that reflects the, the non-independence, and so that's going to be the grouped correlated binary model. Um, we're going to be um, modeling uh, issues in the following way. Um, we're, going to think, we're going to think about um, whether IID is a reasonable assumption whenever we run these models, and it's not always a reasonable assumption. Uh, even the days of the week uh, for a, my newspaper example might not be reasonable, right, because you don't because it might very well be that, that you have a pattern that you read on weekends and you don't read during the week. Or if you don't read one day, perhaps that's because you're away and you didn't get the physical newspaper, and therefore you're less likely to read on the other days. So there's a correlation among them, even after you take into account the explanatory variables, which let's suppose didn't include whether you're on vacation. Um, so... <clears throat> You always have to figure out whether the assumptions, not the axioms, but the assumptions of the model really are reasonable. Um, the variance of uh, y in this case is pi times 1 minus pi over n. There's no sigma-like parameter to take up the slack in the uncorrelated binary model. Um, so that's an interesting fact. Um, and uh, an even more interesting fact is that these two are the same. Okay, so they're observationally the same. So what do I mean by that? So if you have non-independence, then you're going to need a sigma squared. You're going to need some, par some type of parameter to, to soak up the slack. Um, the only way that, you're gonna, that we're going to know the value of the, uh, of the variance parameter, the only way, the only way the variance parameter is going to be exactly equal to pi times 1 minus pi over n, the only time, is if you have independence across the Bernoulli trials. If there's dependence, then there's going to be some other parameter there that will either make them all make the variance smaller. Suppose there's complete dependence. Suppose that either you read every day of the week or you or you never read at all, right? You know, that could be the way that 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 it's measured in fact. If that's the case, then there's complete correlation, 100% correlation. So there's not going to be any variance across the, um, the Bernoulli trials, right? So there's going to be zero variance. So clearly, we need some adjustment here. So these two are the same issue, which is pretty interesting. Um, so here's a new model. This is the extended beta binomial model. Okay, it's the beta binomial model, something you, you may have heard of, you may not have heard of, that's totally fine. You may hear of, you will likely hear of in the future. It's extended a little bit to increase the parameter space that turns out to be possible. Okay, so what is this thing? So here's what it looks like. So Y is distributed as an EBB, extended beta binomial model, with mean pi, same sort of pi as before, um, and our dispersion parameter, or variance parameter, it's, our, it's the extra parameter that didn't exist in the, in the, in the binomial model. Um, we're going to have the same systematic component, the logit model, um, and we'll have the same independence assumption. Okay, now I'm going to give you the only thing you don't have for this model, which is the PDF, the probability density. Um, so, um, it, 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 by definition, this thing is going to give us the probability that y is, it takes on some specific value, little y. And little y can be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to this chosen value of n. And what does it look like? What does this distribution look like? That's what it looks like. Okay. Now, well, what is this thing? Well, it, the math looks complicated, but don't get overwhelmed by the math because conceptually it's very simple. Conceptually, it looks like sort of like a normal distribution with a mean 
And it turns out it's not a variance, but it's a dispersion parameter. So it's related to the variance. Um, so conceptually, it's basically the same thing as we've done before. So it's not really a big deal. The math is just means that like to calculate this thing, you got to do a bunch of other stuff. So for example, in the denominator here, you have to actually take the product of one plus this parameter times j and j is this just an, an indicator in here and so it's a little bit it's a little bit messy um but but you could absolutely write a function to calculate this thing and once you wrote the function to calculate it it has the same meaning as uh, any other probability density um, and so the role of gamma is to soak up the binomial misspecification um, um, when gamma uh, when, uh, if you assume the binomial, when the extended beta binomial is actually right, then the standard errors uh, and the fit are all wrong. And so you really want to pay attention to, to getting this right. Okay. Um, so how do we simulate quantities of interest from the correlated binary model? Let's think about that. Um, we could draw one simulation. Um, we could run optum. Uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, I mean, we're, go we're going to run Optum to get one simulation. How do we do that? Well, we have to get the maximum likelihood estimates. How do we get that? Well, we know how to get the maximum likelihood estimates. We maximize the, the likelihood function. And the same thing with the variance uh, matrix. Okay, so we run Optum to get, to get those. Um, you then draw uh, A to hat, which is all of our parameters, from a multivariate normal. Why the multivariate normal? Because it's not part of the stochastic component. It's the multivariate normal because of the central limit theorem. Um, we're going to set x to our choice of values, x sub c. We're going to calculate simulations of the probability that any of the component binary variables is 1. Um, and that's the same logistic function, right? So 1 over 1 plus e to the minus x beta. Um, again, if that's the pi you care about. You just simulated it, so you could you could stop if you want. But if you're not sure, or if you need the the values of y, then go another step and um, draw simulate directly from the extended beta binomial model. In R, I don't think there is a function to draw random numbers from the extended beta binomial model. So you'll have to hunt around to see whether there is one, or you could write one yourself. It's not that hard, but it is a little bit of a project. So you'll you'll have to figure it out. Uh, from that, we can compute quantities of interest. We can um, calculate the means of those simulations, the standard deviations, confidence intervals, histograms, whatever it is you choose. Okay. All right. Next, we have count models. All right. So what do we do with count models? Uh, <clears throat> what are count models? Uh, count models are when the dependent variable uh, takes on the non-negative integers. So let's go have a look at those. Um, event count applications are all are often among the most interesting substantive problems in lots of disciplines. Um, the unit of analysis can be over time, they can be over uh, across areas, right, and not over time, or it could be over time and and over and over state. Um, the event count is the number of events in some fixed time period for some unit. Okay, so it's just the number of times something happens. There's no maximum on it like there is for the um, uh, grouped binary case. Um, so there's no upper limit on the number number of counts, although in practice, of course, it, it's not infinite. Um, so can you think of some examples for, from your field? Now that you know that you're about to have this new tool that will yield more interesting results than just running a regression on these data, and often more accurate results, um, you should think about whether there's some data in the field that you might be able to um, use these models for. Um, so some examples from real research are uh, the number of cooperative international incidents, the number of conflictual international incidents, the number of triplets born in Norway in each half decade. Yep, that's an actual article. Um, uh, I wrote an article where I noticed that uh, that um, there were three articles in the leading journals of three separate disciplines published over five decades, all three of which made the same point. And the, same, the, and the point was they took the number of Supreme Court appointments, basically a Supreme Court justice dies, the, the president gets to, to um, nominate a new Supreme, Supreme Court justice and the Senate uh, approves if they do approve. Um, and there's been interest into, well, how many 
um, appointments does a president get? And there's always a lot of interest in whether your candidate, your party's president will get to appoint somebody or whether it's the other party. So it really, really is a issue that matters a lot. And these three articles in the three leading journals all, all compared the distribution of the number of Supreme Court appointments um, in, uh, per president or per year um, to a Poisson distribution. Remember the Poisson distribution models counts. And I noticed that, and oh, and they found, yeah, it fit a Poisson distribution. And all three independently concluded, yeah, um, uh, so therefore uh, it's random. The process is random. Now, the process could be random because after all, Supreme Court justices are people and people do die and the, the, the process might actually be random. Or maybe they would make choices about whether to resign while a president they like is in office um, if they were thinking of resigning in the next few years, right? So maybe they actually do that. And maybe there's other factors that actually have an effect on when there's going to be a new uh, appointment and when, they, when they're going to choose to resign. So they, they just took the data, compared it to a Poisson distribution. And because it fit a Poisson distribution, all three of them independently concluded, yes, it, it, it's random. It's completely random. That conclusion does not follow. Okay, So all three of them made a mistake. Uh, I wrote a little article about this. Um, so all three of them made a mistake. Just because your data fit a, 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 a distribution doesn't mean the data was generated by that distribution. In the case of a Poisson, the sum of two Poisson variables is also Poisson. Okay, So if you have uh, a Poisson variable with a small lambda expected value of event parameters and another Poisson variable with a large lambda, uh, each one of which maybe is random, but they're different lambdas, right? So there's a systematic component driving them uh, in different directions. You put them together, you still get a Poisson distribution, even though there was a systematic component. So I thought, well, let me get this data. Um, so I literally woke up in the morning, had this idea, went to the library, and I coded all the data from the library. And I came back and I, I coded up some explanatory variables, some of which I had, and I put them in and I found, actually, you could predict when Supreme Court, when presidents would get Supreme Court appointments. And so, you know, there, there is a random component, of course, so the, the three previous authors were not wrong, of course, completely, um, but they had all missed an important feature of the, of the uh, process, which is that there are systematic features. So it really makes sense to pay attention to, the, to, to modeling the whole process and seeing what happens. So another example is the annual number of appointments to the United States Supreme Court. Um, the number of coups d'etat in, in uh, African states is, a, is another uh, example. The number of medical consultations that each survey respondent in your data set uh, reports having made. Um, uh, so, all right, so now let's figure out how are we going to build this model from the Poisson to, to model all of this. All right, recall the Poisson distribution's first principles. We're going to begin with a black box observation period where you don't get to see what happens in between, and there's a, a, a point at which you observe the count. So that's the, that, the, so the idea here is that there's an observation period and an event happens, an event happens, no event happens, an event happens, an event happens, et cetera. We don't observe that process in, in count models, in, in the count data generation process. We only observe the total number that occurred at the end of the period. So in the Supreme Court example, the only data was the uh, number of Supreme Court appointments in a presidential term. Um, that's all. Now, of course, we could go back and get the individual data, which would be fine. Sometimes you can get the individual data. Sometimes you can't get the individual data. If you can get it, by all means, you know, get it if it's, if it's straightforward. But um, this models what happens if you don't have it, which is no problem. Okay. Um, so the assumptions of this model concern what happens in the period in which we can't see something, the, what's called the observation period, although it's really the count period where we don't observe things. So it's a little weird calling this the observation period because we don't observe it. We only observe what happens at the end. But it's the period during which the counting happens. Um, 
So uh, uh, it's the black box period is probably a better name. So zero events, um, so here's the assumption, zero events have occurred at the start of the period. Of course, we're counting, right? We have to start with zero. Um, uh, here's a real assumption. No two events can occur at exactly the same moment. And the point there is there's no clumping. It's not true that that you know they all decide to resign together. They're, 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 they're separate decisions. Um, uh, and sometimes, by the way, uh, clumping happens. Sometimes when you observe one thing, you just observe the whole clump of clump of others. Um, so, um, and then the most important substantive feature of the Poisson model is what's called Markov independence, which is the probability of the number of events at time t within this black box observation period, um, given the number of events that have happened up to that time um, it is, is independent. It's constant with respect to t. So basically, it's just saying that the process that's going on in here is not a function of the number of events. So, so a violation of this is if you count the number of phone calls you get or number of email messages you get, um, if you're really getting them independently, that's the assumption here. But in all likelihood, um, or, or actually text messages is a better example. If you get a text message, it just like right now, what's the probability you're going to get a text message in the next five minutes? Is it higher because that text message appeared or is it lower? Well, if you're in that same group chat that I'm in, it's much higher, okay? So because they, be, they tend to be correlated, okay? Um, so that's a violation of Markov independence. If you're willing to assume independence, then we have a Poisson distribution. If you're not, then hang on, we'll get to that, that model as well. Um, so uh, I think we've been talking about when these models model assumptions will be violated, but you always want to ask that question, not because if you can think of a violation, you switch models, but because you want to always push the, the methods until they break, so you can figure out how hard did I have to push before I broke, broke them. And maybe I'll go with, it, go with the model anyway, maybe it won't make that much of a difference, um, or maybe this is absolutely fundamental to the substantive problem at hand, in which case, switch models. Okay. All right, so let's write down the Poisson regression model. <clears throat> um, the model is y is distributed as a Poisson model. Um, uh, gamma, uh, sorry, lambda uh, has a systematic component, which is e to the x beta, and we have an independence assumption. So it's got these three parts. We've swapped out some of the pieces, but it uh, should be getting to be relatively familiar to you. Um, the probability density of all the data um, uh, is just the product over the n observations, which we can do because of the third assumption of independence. Um, I've substituted in the exact formula for the Poisson uh, distribution. That's what it is. We now need the log likelihood. The log of the product is the sum of the logs. The log of uh, the three pieces on the right there on on the in the um, Poisson distribution become three pieces here. Um, this exclamation point, by the way, is not a very excited y. That exclamation point is y factorial, right? So if it's 7 factorial, that's equal to 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Um, the, uh, what happens next? Well, as it happens, uh, not only is it excited, but it's um, embarrassed because it's got no parameter. So it then goes away. And uh, that's a very simple log likelihood just in the form. Um, uh, that's the thing that, of course, that you would write into code, give to Optum, find the maximum likelihood estimates, et cetera. Okay. There's some interesting modeling issues about the Poisson regression model that's different with respect to this model and other models that are worth paying attention to. Um, like the extended beta by binomial, like the extended beta binomial model correcting the binomial model, uh, we have a Markov independence assumption here that matters. Um, there's no extra parameter, like just like the binomial, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, or like sigma squared in the normal, to take up slack. Um, and so the fit might not be right. You need to pay attention to it. Um, the consequences of a, of a violation is that the standard errors are wrong, and sometimes drastically wrong, um, and the fit's wrong. So you really need to figure out, does this model fit the data? Are these assumptions right? If not, then we, we can go to a different model. But let's interpret the results and get a feel for that. Um, 
So if we run the model, we're okay with the model. We're quite okay with assumptions. We, we, we um, want to look at the results. Let's look at the derivative method because I've swapped functional forms. The last several models I've shown you have each had the same logistic functional form and the logistic functional form for the derivative model was, was um, uh, the same. And so here I have a, a new one and so I'm going to do the derivative model. So you have a quick rule of thumb. If you look at the results, you ought to be able to get a sense of what it is. And in particular, if somebody walks into your office, you should have a quick way of getting a feel for what it is that they're talking about uh, or that they've produced uh, in, when they throw it on your desk. So how much does the expected number of events, lambda, change as one of the explanatory variables change? And the answer is it's not beta, like in a linear regression model, but it's lambda times beta. So what, what uh, oh, by the way, that makes sense because when lambda is small, you're at, the, you're at this part of the curve. When lambda is large, you're at this part of the curve. And the farther you are, it's an exponential curve after all, the farther you are uh, up, um, the larger the, the total effect. Okay. So what we could do is we could use the mean of y times beta for an approximately linearizing effect. So what I often do is people walk into my office and they say, okay, I ran a Poisson regression model. I got the results. Here they are. I don't know how to interpret them. Can you help me? Okay. And then I will say, um, okay, what's your dependent variable? And they'll tell me what the dependent variable is. And then I'll say, what's the mean of the dependent variable? And and embarrassingly, in an embarrassingly large number of times, they will say, I don't know, I never looked at that. The first thing you do is look at that, <laughs> okay? So they should always look at that. They should always know that. If they don't know that, then make them go figure it out, okay? Um, uh, in any event, what the, whatever that number is, let's say it's 10, you just take their betas, multiply by 10, and interpret the results as if they're roughly like a linear regression. It's not perfect, but it'll give you a sense of what's going on before you could tell them to go back and do it the right way, which is by simulation. Okay, so to simulate, um, we're going to set x sub c. That's our, um, uh, our uh, choice of the explanatory variable. We're going to draw beta from the um, multivariate normal distribution. We're going to compute uh, lambda tilde by taking beta tilde, sticking it in there. We're going to draw fundamental uncertainty um, from the Poisson distribution, of course. And now we have simulations of the y's, um, given the choices of the x. Um, so that's a straightforward simulation. It parallels what we've done before in, in quite the same way. Um, the variance under misspecification, it's worth paying attention to, because I keep coming back to this, so now let's talk about the consequences. Under the Poisson model, the variance of y, given x, is equal to the expected value. That's the feature of the Poisson distribution. Um, it's heteroscedastic. The variance varies. It's not like a, a homoscedastic regression model with sigma squared set to one. It's heteroscedastic, but it's fixed. It's a particular type of heteroscedasticity that always must be the same. Um, the variance uh, is greater than the expected value. Uh, I'm sorry, if the variance is greater than the expected value, you have what's called over-dispersion. That violates the assumption of the Poisson model. In this case, if you run the Poisson model anyway, the standard errors will be too small. This is a very common situation. Uh, if the variance is smaller than the expected value, then you have what's called under-dispersion, and the standard errors are too big. Okay. The only way to know these things is to, is to estimate them. Note, however, that they're all conditional upon x. So if you condition on different explanatory variables that explain the data better and soak up more of the variance and put more of the variance, move more of the variance from the stochastic component to the systematic component by putting in those variables, that will change the definition of over and under, under dispersion. And you might be able to correct for the problems in the model just by putting in better explanatory variables. Um, the variance conditional upon x um, uh, it, uh, it, uh, is exactly what I'm describing here. The dispersion changes with the specification. Okay, so I want to make sure you saw that. Okay, uh, so have a quick look at this. Um, this is a normal distribution because the graphs are prettier. This is a normal distribution, but stylized. So sigma squared is always one with three cases. The predicted values of a regression line, x horizontally, y vertically, and standard error bars, plus or minus um, two standard deviations. 
uh, and I have three data sets, one which comes from the stylized normal with sigma squared one, one with sigma squared set to be much smaller, and one with sigma squared set to be much larger. So this is the case in which the stopped clock is, is right, um, you know, on, twice a day or whatever it is. Um, so that's what happens with the stylized, stylized normal. Um, it, now I'm going to show you exactly the same thing, but with a Poisson distribution, which has the same characteristics. It's just a little harder to see. Um, this comes from a paper I wrote with uh, Kurt Signorino, who was um, in this class and also a TF in this class some time ago. He's a professor at the University of Rochester now. <clears throat> um, so here we have uh, under dispersion, where there's less variability than expected. Here we have appropriate dispersion. So we, we only want 5% of the dots outside here, which is about right. <clears throat> and here we have over dispersion, which is a bit more common. Um, okay. So now we need a model to, to take that into account. We need a model to um, be the analogy to the extended beta binomial model when the binomial model had this independence assumption that looked like it was wrong. So the Poisson model has an independence assumption that can be wrong. Uh, in the ways that we just described. The negative binomial event count model, in particular, deals with over-dispersion. So for over-dispersed data, conditional on x, um, here's the negative binomial model. Y is distributed as a negative binomial. There's a mean, uh, phi, and a variance term. It's, it's, again, it's a dispersion parameter, uh, which I'm going to call sigma squared. Uh, we'll have a systematic component, which will be the same as the Poisson model. And we'll have our independence assumption the same as the Poisson model. The likelihood, uh, note, note I skipped a step, right? So instead of showing you the negative binomial, I just wrote the likelihood. And of course, this is the negative binomial. And the likelihood is the product in front of it, right? Um, uh, so what is this thing, okay? Um, it's just a different mathematical form. Conceptually, it's quite analogous to just a, a, a normal distribution with a mean and a variance. Here, there's a mean and a dispersion parameter. The particular math is complicated in a different way. It's totally doable. You could write a function that implements this. And once you have that, you've sort of black boxed it, and it's OK. Um, there's some interesting computational issues here. Um, so first of all, we have this gamma thing. So gamma is what is that that's it's the gamma function the gamma function is a continuous version of the factorial so for um for uh fa for discrete um values of a here gamma is is a factorial um for continuous values between two like for 2.3 2.3 factorial doesn't have any definition but gamma of 2.3 has a definition okay in this model, when we're going to write down the log of it, we're going to have the log of gamma. We're not going to have gamma. We're always going to have the log of gamma. So what that means is we could just take the gam gamma of the number and then take the log of that number. The problem is that the, that gamma or the factorial of a number is often an immense number. And it can be too big for a computer to represent and you'll get overflow problems and the, and the computer will crash. However, that's, that's okay with us because we're then going to take the log and shrink it back down. So if you computationally do it in those two steps, it'll crash. But fortunately, there's a nice little function in R called L gamma, which does the log and the gamma all at the same time. And instead of blowing it up and then bringing it back down, it just makes the calculation we want. And so you just swap out log of gamma for the log gamma function. Okay. Um, beta is unbounded, so no need to reparameterize. Sigma squared, of course, is bounded. It has to be, uh, uh, in this case, greater than 1. It's not a variance. It's a dispersion parameter. Um, and so uh, it has to be greater than 1. The degree to which it's greater than 1 indicates the degree to which it deviates from the Poisson model. Um, so we're going to have to reparameterize this. So let's come up with a new reparameterization to keep sigma squared greater than one. And so here's what, here's what we do. We say sigma squared is equal to e to, the, uh, e to the gamma plus one. So that means gamma could be any number, negative or positive. And once you uh, exponentiate it and add one, you get sigma squared. And sigma squared then will always be greater than one. So that's a way to reparameterize uh, here. Um, so the interpretation, um, the variance of y given x is the mean 
times sigma squared. So in the Poisson, it's just equal to the mean. Here it's the mean times sigma squared, where sigma squared is greater than one. Um, let's recall that the limit as, uh, as sigma squared goes to one, you know, gets smaller and smaller. The negative binomial becomes the Poisson. But uh, you can't do a test of the, to see whether the Poisson model fits using the negative binomial. You can't do the likelihood ratio with these two because the Poisson doesn't nest within the, the negative binomial because sigma squared can't be exactly one. Now you can tell that it can't be exactly one because if it were exactly one, we'd be dividing by zero here. It can, of course, be 1.00001, et cetera. It just can't be one. So one doesn't nest within the other. You can't run the, 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 um, the likelihood ratio test. But you can, of course, look and see what sigma squared is. If sigma squared is close to one, then you basically have the Poisson distribution. If sigma squared is much larger, then you're getting extra value from running the negative binomial distribution. And you have some overdispersion in your, in your data. The overdispersion, by the way, conditional upon x, might actually be interesting. You have just determined, you have just estimated that the, that in the black box observation period, it is the case that when one event happens, it's more likely that other events happen. Over dispersion is the same thing as contagion, at least when we observe it. Um, so it may be of substantive interest that sigma squared is a good deal greater than one. All right. Well, be careful of off-the-shelf programs. It's not that they're wrong, it's that they could be in interpreted in, in different ways. I have the variance here parameterized in this model as, as the mean times sigma squared, but some, some programs have the mean parameterized as, as, uh, as the, excuse me, have the variance parameterized as the mean uh, times one plus uh, sigma squared times the mean. Um, there's no real reason why you should necessarily have one versus the other, okay. All right, I'm going to go one more step because the negative binomial, as you may have noticed, noticed only deals with over dispersion. But what about under dispersion? So the generalized event count model, which is a model that I actually came up with and wrote some articles on, does over dispersion, under dispersion, and Poisson dispersion. So it sort of does, does all of it. Um, <clears throat> um, the stochastic component of this model is the GEC model, the generalized event count model. It has a mean, it has a variance. Conceptually, no big deal, right? It gives you the probability that y takes on the value little y, given the parameters, the mean and the dispersion parameter. Um, this is what the mathematical form looks like. It looks a bit messy, um, but it, and you could figure out how to interpret this thing. You could write this into a function. It would take a little bit more time than doing the others, but once it's in there, it has the same substantive meaning, at least in, in, by analogy, as a normal distribution or negative binomial distribution. It is, of course, different and useful for different purposes. Um, but just because the math is a little messy doesn't matter. Conceptually, it's the same thing. You don't need to worry yourself with whether, whether this formula is correct. It's probably correct. It's been published. Um, other people have written about it, you know, um, uh, in any event. Um, uh, Okay, so um, there's a, uh, two, in addition to the stochastic component, we're going to add a systematic component. We're going to add the same systematic component as for the Poisson and negative binomial models. Uh, lambda, or the expected value of y given x, is equal to e to the x beta. Um, again, crazy math, but the same logical structure as all the other models we're, gonna, we're talking about today. Okay, so the interpretation, um, special cases of the GEC, this is the part that just feels good. Um, when sigma squared, the same sigma squared uh, that we were describing earlier, um, is greater than one, you have the over dispersed case and the special case of the GEC is the negative binomial. Um, when sigma squared is equal to one, you get exactly the Poisson distribution. And when sigma squared is between zero and one, you get um, the binomial distribution if it happens that, that lambda over one minus sigma squared is an integer, and otherwise you, you still get a distribution which I call the continuous parameter binomial. Okay, so um, you can determine whether you have over dispersion, under dispersion, or Poisson dispersion by just running the GEC model and you can see what the, what the parameter values are. Um, you can simulate the three parts um, by, by um, you know how to simulate the Poisson distribution. There's a Poisson random number generator in, uh, in R. You can simulate 
uh, the negative binomial, you could simulate the continuous parameter binomial by figuring those out. And then you could simulate the GEC by first figuring out what the value of sigma is, then you figure out which category you're in, and then you use that simulator. Okay. Um, these are the papers with uh, Kurt Signorino that I mentioned. Okay. All right. So what happens with this extra parameter? Well, you get to fix this, this stopped clock problem. So now we have three cases um, where the three data sets, but the model itself adjusts because of the extra dispersion. Now we're getting about 95% in all three cases. So ta-da, that's the part where where the where the audience breaks out to, into spontaneous applause. How come I'm not hearing anything? Okay, never mind while I tell jokes entirely by myself in this room. Okay, um, last set of models for today. Duration models and censoring. So duration models is how long it takes something, hap something to happen, and censoring is when we don't get all the data we want. Okay, the simplest version of a duration model is an exponential model. <clears throat> Um, the density, the probability density, follows the same first principles as a Poisson distribution, except that we observe the duration between the events instead of observing a count of the number of events at the end of the observation period. So now that black box um, observation period for the Poisson, now we're actually observing the, the time between events. Um, <clears throat> so the model works as follows. Y of i, which is how long something happened, follows an exponential distribution. That is the probability density for the exponential distribution. Um, it has a, um, exp a um, systematic component, which is e to, the, e to the x beta. It's the same thing as in the Poisson negative binomial and generalized event count case. And we'll also assume the independence assumption. Um, <clears throat> when would this model apply? Think about applications when this model might apply. I'm going to give you an example in a minute. Um, uh, but first, let's write down the log likelihood and see how we can estimate it. It's very straightforward. We take the log of this model here, and we get the log of the first piece, the log of lambda, and the log of the, the, log of the second piece. We substitute in the systematic component, and we get that. Um, this, is a, this is the reference I was referring to a minute ago. Um, this is with Jim Alt, who just uh, retired from this department. Uh, Nancy Burns, who's a former student, she was in this class. She was the TF for this class, and she's now the chair of, of her department at the uh, University of Michigan. And Mick Laver, who's uh, at NYU. Uh, and we wrote a model on how long um, parliamentary, uh, how long the cabinets last in parliamentary democracies. Okay. So there's one other topic, which very frequently comes up in the context of duration models, but it comes up in lots of other contexts also, but it's straightforward to introduce here, and it's, it's, it's always relevant here. It came up in this paper that, that we wrote, um, and the question is what to do about censoring. So here's some examples. Um, for our paper, we had parliamentary coalition duration. How long did a, did a parliamentary coalition last no problem, we just count how long it lasts. So what's the number of months in office, right? However, when we did the study, some of them hadn't, hadn't collapsed yet. So what are we supposed to do about those? We could throw them away. We could include them and guess how long they're going to last. What is it that we do? They're censored. That's the value. The, value, the answer is it, it has a value. What we know is they've lasted at least this long, and we don't know how much longer they're going to last. Um, the duration of unemployment spells. Some people may still be unemployed in your sample. Well, are they going to be unemployed forever? For another three seconds? How long? Um, duration in graduate school. This number may have occurred to you, and if not you, maybe your folks and your friends and things like that. Okay. So um, um, a few years ago, the government department wanted to know how long the average graduate students spent getting a PhD at Harvard. And what the uh, department administrator did, she's not a, she, wasn't a, um, uh, she wasn't a statistical analyst, so cut her, some, cut her a break. But what she did was she um, went back 10 years. She took the whole class of people that, that started 10 years before, and she followed each person, all of whom she knew very well, and she uh, counted how many years it took them to get a PhD, and, uh, and then she, she averaged those. And I said, hey, um, what'd you do about the um, people that are still in graduate school after 10 years? 
And she said, oh, well, I don't know how long they are going to take to graduate, so I just deleted them. I said, no, 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 hold on a second, <laughs> right? Because those people that she deleted were the ones that were going to take the longest because they'd taken at least 10 years, and we don't know how much longer they're going to take. So that's not the right thing. And she said, well, okay, should I code them all at 10 years? No, that's not the right thing either. Should I code them all at 12 and a half years, just to guess? No, that's not. So we have to come up with a better, a better way of doing this. Um, so duration in graduate school. The real question is, what will we do with you, okay, who are still in graduate school? Okay. Um, longevity. <clears throat> You're trying to measure how long people live and predict and explain that. Pretty important topic. But some people are still alive, which is a good thing, but sort of messes things up for us analytically. Um, the time since you called home, right? How long is that? Uh, and who's waiting for that call? Um, all right. So what do you do with the unfinished observations? That's the question. You could drop them. That creates selection bias. That's, that's the technical term. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we'll deal with selection bias in lots of ways. Uh, we could set the duration equal to the observed value. That's extremely optimistic, like uh, for the um, for those uh, in graduate school, right? If we just if we take the people who've taken ten years and we say, oh, they're, they're just going to they're, they're graduating right now. That's an optimistic viewpoint. It is not contradicted by the data, but nevertheless, it's quite optimistic. It's likely to be an underestimate. Um, uh, we could guess, um, we could guess, right? And, but the problem is even a good guesser has uncertainty and that uncertainty isn't reflected in the data. If we just say it's 12.5 years, well, um, you know, I mean, like, like it's not reasonable to say that we're always going to guess, right? We're going to take the 12.5, put it in the computer, and the computer's going to think that 12.5 has the same uncertainty as, 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 as the number four, where somebody graduated in four years, right? And that's not right. So we, we clearly, at a minimum, are going to have to re reflect the uncertainty in a different way and also probably um, uh, pay attention to, to bias as well. Um, so what we want to do is include all the information we have and no more information. So the problem here is not that we, that we are missing some information. We're always missing some information. The problem here is we haven't really figured out how to include that information. So that's what I'm going to, going to talk about now. We're going to figure out how to put that information in. All right. <clears throat> Last slide, by the way. Uh, so we're going to, we're going to, incorporate uh, the censoring information into the likelihood. So let's just formalize it. So for observation y of i, uh, we observe either the true underlying continuous duration, y star, if it's less than some censoring point. In the, in, in the um, graduate school example, it was 10 years. That was the censoring point. So if, it's less, if, if you took less than 10 years, uh, if that class, if somebody in that class from 10 years ago took less than 10 years, we observe the, the unobserved variable. So y is equal to y star. If it's greater than 10 years, then all we observe is c, this, the censored value. So just write, so we have to figure out what to do with that observation mechanism, but that's our observation mechanism. The likelihood for censored observations is like, let's just write down only what we know and nothing else. And so this is a graph of what we know. On the horizontal axis is the unobserved duration in, let's say, in graduate school. Um, uh, C is the censored value. Uh, here I'm imagining censoring is, is, is at six. Um, <clears throat> um, anything beyond this, we don't know what the value is. But we do know if you believe the model, if you believe the model, if you believe the model, right? It's all conditional upon the model. Um, we do know that the probability of being in this region is the area under the curve. So we don't know the height of the curve at that point as we do if, if your observed value is a three. We just go up to here and the log likelihood is the log of that point. If you're in this region, you don't know where in the region you are, but you know you're greater than C. So the fact that you know is not the height of the curve. It is the probability of being in the region. So let's just use that. So let's use those, let's have a two-part likelihood that uses only what we know for each of the observations. So the probability that Y is censored is the same thing as the probability that the, unob the unobserved variable um, is greater than or equal to C. I'm just restating the same thing. And that's the same thing as the area in red in this curve. It's the integral from C up to infinity of the exponential um, distribution. Um, uh, so that integral, 
right? That's the formula for the integral. It turns out that integral is very simple and it has a very specific form. It's equal to the exponentiation of minus uh, lambda times c. Um, <clears throat> so that means the f we can write down the full likelihood in the following way. The likelihood of beta given y um, has two parts. The first part in black here is just the, um, uh, the it, ju it, it only describes the observations which were not censored. Those are the people who graduated in less than 10 years. And it works just like the other um, uh, uh, likelihoods we've seen before. Um, for the second piece, that is for the people who've taken at least 10 years, but we don't know how long, what we know, given the model, is that, is that their process is going to follow this model. So what is it that we know? We know that, that for each of them, the probability of y star being less than c is this area. Now you have to ask yourself, is that the right number? Okay. It, I mean, is that right? Or do, do we really know that? Well, if you've committed to the model, then it is the right number. But should you have committed to that model, right? Is it plausible? Does it make sense? Remember, we don't observe anything in the red region. We're assuming it. So the, the censored piece here is a, a, a complete reflection of all the information we have. And it's, it's certainly going to be better than just deleting the people who haven't, who have taken more than 10 years, but it is model dependent. Right? It might be that anybody that takes more than 10 years is going to take at least 30 years, right? And it doesn't drop off the way that, the, sorry, it doesn't drop off the way the graph does. Um, so you have to think about the use of these assumptions, but if you pay attention to them, th then this can be um, a very valuable tool. And this is the first hint of how we include censored information in a, in a likelihood. So what we've done today is we've shown you the same tools applied to lots and lots of different models, and each one faster than the previous one. Each one presages all kinds of other models that we'll be able to do. So there's lots of really cool things coming, and uh, I look forward to seeing you then. Thanks for listening and watching.